their instructional experiences. Had to go back. Well, as a matter of fact, for cohort one, the quality of instructional experience accounted for 95% of their responses. Students wrote about negative interactions with their teachers at a rate of four times their, the positive interactions. So what do students write about instruction? Their experience of struggling to learn from unkind, impatient middle school and high school teachers with little compassion for students. And this is the rehumanizing of, of the students themselves. Despite <clears throat> desire for better high school math teachers because they were young and experienced and disconnected from their students. Classroom interactions were described as being racialized. Uh, and there was high praise for a teacher in a special development program for ability to understand, uh, ability to explain mathematics in a way that students can understand. So it doesn't matter what your race ethnicity would be, students are looking for opportunities for, to have teachers that explain mathematics in a way that it can be understand, understood. Okay. When it came to motivation and self-concept, which is another one of the uh, main themes, it says, students wrote about fear of looking or sounding dumb or unintelligent during instructional time, and commitment to perseverance and hard work and moving forward, and dedication to taking personal responsibility and owning uh, the role in being successful by studying and focusing on work. So those were some of the things that they wrote about. Now in cohort two, cohort two, if you remember, was a set of students who were uh, enroll, going to be enrolled in the uh, elementary education program. The factors cited most often were the same as cohort one, quality of instruction and motivation and self-concept. But what is different in their results is the relationship between, between their perceived positive and negative interactions with their teachers. The numbers of reported negative and positive interactions were almost equal, whereas with the other students, uh, the negative interactions were four times the positive interactions. Okay. Oh. Okay. Also, unlike cohort one, many of these students had taken four years of mathematics while in high school, and they exhibited a relatively higher level of self-confidence and persistence and perseverance in doing mathematics. So it was, it was a difference in, 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 in how they felt that they can do the mathematics. So a lot of self-concept, self-efficacy was very important in their case. In cohort two, what were some of the students? I entered algebra one, I grasped some concepts and struggled with others. My teacher did a poor job of thoroughly explaining some concepts. I received a C in my freshman year. I vowed to myself that I would always pay attention in math class and always ask questions. From sophomore to senior year, I completed math with a B. And then another said, freshman year, I took algebra and absolutely loved it. Me and my teacher were always really close, and that really had a positive effect on my math experience for that year, junior year. The teacher and I did not really click but I still received an A. So what happened with that student is that there was a determination that regardless of what the relationship with the teacher was, hopefully most, mostly positive, that that student was determined to do well. Uh, oh, this, okay, and this was the last set of comments about standardized tests. Students in both cohorts were very aware of the relationship between performing well on standardized math tests and how the results could be used to make high stakes decisions that would influence their course options, or life course options. Some students developed a love-hate relationship with mathematics, which ultimately caused anxiety with respect to standardized tests and doubt 
uh, in their ability to do well on mathematics assessment tests. Now, what about the experiences of successful African Americans in STEM? What do we learn from the literature? Well, an article by Williams in 2012 found that the majority of experiences of successful African Americans in STEM took place within their communities and were mediated by family members or other community members. So, that might suggest that the more African Americans that you have in STEM, that if this is the experience of those who are successful, then perhaps that's one way to fill the pipeline. And then McGee 2015 found that African American pre-service teachers who had positive early experience in mathematics reported black male fathers and close male relatives as their first mathematics teachers. And these studies suggest that early experiences of African Americans in STEM were less likely attributed to experiences in formal school environments. At least this what these uh, research shows. But it doesn't help to add their ex good experience in formal settings. So, three different groups of African Americans with different early experiences in mathematics, especially student-teacher interactions and the level of motivations and self-concept led to three different life options outcomes that were related to the context in which they experienced their mathematics teaching and learning. Achievement gaps between racial ethnic groups exist. However, in addition to just paying attention to the gap, Researchers and practitioners should focus on understanding how learners perceive or explain their own achievement gap and a manifestation of systemic inequalities and inequities in educational systems that seem to be in a continual state of reform. I think that's, that's it. Okay. So there is a need to generate more understanding about how national education policies that carry broadly defined high stakes consequences influence the mathematics learning and achievement of all students over time, and especially for those for whom equity of opportunity and equality of outcomes seems perpetually elusive. That's it. Questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. In cohort one, did they begin in 2016? Or was it 2006? 2006. 2006. Yes. Yeah. Oh, she wanted to know in cohort one, did they begin in 2016? Or 2006, yes, it was yes, because I was there. I was their teacher. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, it, it's still elusive. And I, and I, to be honest, I really don't know how much of that 20% was explained by their letters, but um, part of the research was to find out, uh, you know, whether or not to, the students had something to say about their experiences that wasn't explained in one, of, in one of those nine, any of those nine factors. And I really wanted to hear from them. Yes. You mentioned that cohort one, um, I can't remember the exact words, but that they were worried about how they would look if they asked questions. Yes. About looking dominant. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that seemed like it could have come from their psychological environment at this point. Mm -hmm. Psychologic, yes. The, you know, reactions of peers or teachers. Yes.
Dina? Dude, come on down here and answer some of these questions. <laughs> One thing about that cohort, too, uh, we have an elementary education program that focuses on math and science. And so in our recruitment efforts, we seek to admit students to that elementary education program uh, who have done well in mathematics, who've taken the, the math courses, and uh, also uh, in terms of their affect, in terms of uh, that they um, are not afraid of it. Do I need this? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you repeat the question? Just. I'm wondering whether you got some insight into what it was about the, the psychological environment or otherwise that you felt contributed to um, to some kids, especially in cohort one, feeling um, worried about looking dumb. You know, these are. What I got from the comments that they made was that they were willing to work hard, they wanted to succeed, and yet in the past they had been sitting back because they were worried about how they would look. And I was wondering if you if you got some insights into how did that happen that you had this group that wanted to do well, but they were feel like they weren't feeling safe about speaking up. I think with uh, cohort two, the difference is that um, they had been normed to a lot of standardized tests by that time. And so um, even though they had the same level of anxiety, that, that they reported the same level of maybe um, disengagement or poor affect, um, they didn't attribute it to themselves as much as they attributed it to testing and the environment, and they were more aware of the effect of testing and, and, and standardization on them. So they, they attributed it to outside sources and not inside sources. I think that's the difference, whereas with the first cohort, it was just a little bit after NCLB, and so I don't think it was standardized tests were as, um, they hadn't gone through as many standardized tests as the second cohort. So that's maybe why they attributed it, it to their own abilities. I might add, too, that cohort one um, had been con conditionally admitted to a business program, and they were, um, they were in a summer bridge program. So they had to perform well during the summer, or uh, they may not be admitted to the university. So they were kind of in that situation as well. Yes. I did not notice any regional differences. Um, that's one reason why I reported um, the, the variability of where they, and the diversity of where the, just, and that's 28. Now, I, I, I want to caution, this was a, um, an initial study we don't want to make these broad uh, inferences based on a sample size of 28, but I thought it was very I interesting. So uh, if we repeat the study and we find that, uh, you know, these uh, results are consistent, you know, then we can make some broad. But it was very interesting just to uh, do this for a first time. But I, I want you to know that I am fully aware of the sample size here. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about the cohort one. Mm -hmm. Well, I was one of the teachers, <laughs> and so uh, I, I, I had been teaching in a developmental program for 20 years, and it was the type of developmental program where we did teach the elementary algebra for the students who were coming in, but we would also loop with them and teach the courses as they moved into the mathematics department. So they felt very comfortable um, with me and with the other professor who was teaching the course. And that was the, and that was the idea. Um, we wanted to, um, and this is what, what, 
This is what I've experienced there, is that we wanted them to feel like we were other mothers and fathers and we were going to take care of them and make sure that they accomplish what they needed to accomplish in order to get into the business program. And did they all get in? They all got in. <laughs> <laughs> and we followed them. You know, we just didn't just stop with the uh, bridge program at the end of the summer. We followed their progress during the fall and, and in, into their freshman year to make sure that they were, because eventually they had to take calculus as well in this business program. Well, thank you so much. I know we've gone over time, and I appreciate you uh, staying with us throughout this. But thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of the week. Thank you. That was great. I, I, I really like your stuff. I really like your stuff. It's all very preliminary. Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was yeah. fun when you called and asked me. I thought, because yeah. you saw that. And